How on earth could Magnus Carlsen pull off this crazy move against my former chess coach? Believe it or not, my former coach was up a pawn against Magnus in the Qatar Masters tournament. But with a pair of brilliant moves, things become very unclear. So can my former coach take down the strongest player in the world, Magnus Carlsen? And here is a picture from my old chess scrapbook with my former coach, Gregory Kaidanov, and I playing in a simul. There's another picture of him there. And here you see the score sheet. And that game lasted till around 10 p.m., so he really knew how to wear out a young player. Fortunately for him, he got the win in that one. And the game between Magnus and Kaidanov starts with d4, d5. And at this point, Gregory had five points out of seven going into this game. Magnus had four and a half out of seven. And he had just lost to a player 200 points lower rated. So you know Magnus really wanted to secure this victory with the black, with the white pieces, excuse me. So he plays the London, and we see c5 by Kainanov, fighting for space in the center. e3, knight c6, c3, knight f6, knight d2. These are all standard moves. e6, knight g to f3. Now, here we have a branching point. There's a couple strong moves for black, and Kaidanov chooses a trendy move with c takes d4, relieving some of the tension in the center. He takes d4, knight h5. Now, what I like about this move is Black is saying, okay, I want to trade a knight for a bishop and go for the bishop pair advantage. So now it makes the most sense for Magnus to retreat the bishop to e3, which he does, preserving his two bishops. Bishop d6, bishop d3, knight f4. And this line is a specialty of Indian grandmaster Arjun Aragaisi. And the idea is Kaidanov wants to trade knight for bishop no matter what. So we have this fork of d3 and g2. And the only good move for white here is to grab the knight. Bishop takes f4. So that's what Magnus does. Gives up the bishop pair. Bishop takes f4. Castle, castle, rook e1, bishop d7. And at this point, according to Stockfish, the position is equal. So that's an opening win for Kaidanov with the black pieces. He's able to equalize 12 moves in against the strongest player in the world, Magnus Carlsen. Now, pros and cons of this position. A pro for black. Kaidanov has the bishop pair, two bishops against bishop and knight. But a pro for white is that bishop on d7 is a bad piece, blocked behind this pawn chain on the light squares. Knight b3 by Magnus, eyeing knight to c5, a nice outpost square for the knight. b6, Kaidanov prevents it. Queen e2. And what we have here is called a Carlsbad pawn structure. So we have the two queen side pawns for black. We have this pawn chain for white. And then this pawn chain for black and these pawns for white. If you ever see this pawn structure, it's very common in chess. It's called the Carlsbad structure. And what Magnus wants to do is he wants to push this A pawn up the board, attack the B pawn. He already has his queen and bishop lined up over here. Rook, knight, he's ready to play queenside. So now we see g6 by Kaidanov, and this prepares to fight against knight to e5. So there's some positions where that bishop can get stuck out on f4. And now he has a nice escape route to tuck back on g7. a4, f6. Kaidanov is playing very solid here, putting all of these pawns on the sixth rank. And this prevents knight e5 completely because of f takes e5. Bishop to b5. And here Magnus highlights that the bishop on d7 is a little bit overworked. This is something you can look for in your own games. Look for overworked pieces and try to take advantage of those pieces. The bishop on d7 now has to defend the knight and has to defend the e-pawn, because Magnus is threatening not only bishop takes knight, but he's also threatening queen takes e6 check. So queen c7 played, pawn to a5, rook a to e8, and here Kaidanov is saying, I don't want the rook trade. So if a takes b, a takes b, Magnus might be looking to swap rooks down the a-file. Kaidanov says, I don't want any of that. Puts his rook over on the e8 square. g3, bishop h6. A takes B, A takes B, and now at this point it's difficult to figure out how do you make progress as white? We do see the open A file, but a lot of these squares are already guarded by the black side. Um, A6 is really the only available square, but there's not much you can do with that. So Magnus decides, let's try to create more risk in the position, and he plays pawn to C4. So this creates pawn tension between the two pawns, and after D takes C4, Queen takes C4, Magnus has now created a pawn weakness for himself on d4, but 
he's made that pawn on e6 a bigger target because now this diagonal is open to the pawn. So it's kind of pros and cons, but Magnus wants to make this position more dynamic because he's playing for a win. And sometimes in chess, you have to take more risks to create more winning chances. That's exactly what Magnus does here. Queen to d6, keeping an eye on the threat for Magnus to play pawn to d5, and things are about to get wild. Rook a6 by Magnus, attacking b6. So notice how Magnus just keeps poking. He keeps playing for the initiative, playing actively. Rook to b8. Kaidanov defends the pawn on b6. And now Magnus unleashes a brilliant move. If you want to pause the video, try to find the move for yourself. The move that Magnus plays is the only good move. Knight to c5. I should say it's the only move to play for an advantage. And this is a crazy move. And in this position, there is only one good reply for black. And that's knight takes d4, which was played in the game. Now, let's see what happens if b takes c5. So this is kind of the point of this knight sacrifice. After d takes c5 hitting the queen, the queen has to move. The queen swap off. Minor pieces trade. And after rook takes c6, rook takes b2, rook c7, material is equal, but there's this super strong pass pawn. And Magnus is about to double rooks on the seventh rank. And this game is pretty much in losing territory for black already. So it was not safe to take the knight on c5, but instead, Hednov finds the best move, knight takes d4. Knight takes d4 by Magnus, queen takes c5. Now, at this point, Magnus is down a pawn and about to have a queen trade occur, right? Queens are lined up. Is he at risk of losing against my former coach, Gregory Kaidanov? I think yes. I think this is a position where if Magnus isn't careful, that extra pawn plus the bishop pair for, for Kaidanov could lead to a win. So this is a super exciting position, not only for my coach, but for myself as a fan of my former coach. Rook a7 played, active play by Magnus, attacking the bishop. This bishop couldn't take because it, it's currently guarding the queen. Rook to d8. Pawn to b4, and Magnus forces the queen trade. Magnus is taking this into an endgame, a pawn down. And technically, according to the engine, this endgame is equal. So we've seen on this channel already the theme of equal endgames. I love endgames, and I'm trying to learn how to play equal endgames for the win. Maybe we can see that in this position from either side. Equal endgame can either side press for the win. From a human perspective, I like black here still extra pawn and the bishop pair could kind of take down magnus which would be an amazing result let's see what happens the threat right now is knight takes e6 immediately so what was played in the game rook f to e8 slight inaccuracy the top move here is really hard to find it's pawn to b5 and the idea is after bishop takes e6 bishop takes knight takes rook e8 Black is holding with a dead equal position. So it was actually best for Black to try to swap down into a more drawish equal position. Instead, Rook F to E8 is played, and Magnus is trying to figure out how do I win that extra pawn, and Kaidanov is saying, I'm going to try to hold down the fort. If Magnus decides to just take here, that probably leads to a very similar line to that B5 line we just looked at, where it's a very drawish equal position. Whereas right now we have a dynamic equal position. So Magnus himself plays pawn to b5, the top move, and all of a sudden black's position is looking a little bit cramped. This pawn does a great job guarding c6, and knight to c6 is a threat here as well. Bishop c8 by Kaidanov, knight c6, rook d6. And this was the idea with bishop back to c8. After knight c6, the rook is able to come up. Rook c7, and Magnus is just relentless here with the threats. Rook takes c8 is the threat, and after rook takes back, bishop takes e6, forking the king and the rook. Magnus just loves pressing in these equal endgames. Idana plays bishop to d7, and this is a mistake, and I'm going to show you why. Let's first look at the correct move. King to h8, and this is a hard move to find, and white only has a small advantage here after playing rook to a1. Now, there's a pretty forced sequence that you can play as black, rook to d7, offering the rook trade. And after rook takes c8, the strongest move, 
rook takes c8, bishop takes e6. This skewers the two rooks. Black gives the exchange back. Rook check, the king moves. White can go after the b-pawn. And I know this is a long line, but in the end, we actually reached this position. This was top play for both sides, and it should lead to a draw with best play. The bishop is stronger than the knight, and the king is pretty close to stopping, helping stop this b-pawn. That's a crazy line with only a slight edge for white. Idanov did not play it, though. And instead, in this position, he played bishop to d7, a mistake. And Magnus finds the top move, rook to a1. And this threatens to put that rook down on the seventh rank. Doubled rooks on the seventh rank spells trouble for black. Bishop f8 played rook a to a7, double attack on this bishop on d7. We see bishop takes c6. B takes c6. Magnus is still down one pawn. We're on move 33. But he has this pass pawn, and he has the doubled rook still on the 7th. Rook d1 check. King g2. Rook c1. Active defense by Kaidanov. That's usually a great idea in endgames. And here, it actually encourages Magnus to make a bit of a mistake. What he should play is bishop to b5 or bishop to a6. Instead, he plays rook to a4. That gives back a bit of the advantage that he had b5, bishop takes, rook c5, bishop c4. Now this is a critical move for black. The position calls for pawn to f5, and there's a very subtle idea with pawn to f5. In the game, bishop to d6 was played, and let me show you the difference. After pawn to f5, if rook to b7, rook to e7, trying to swap rooks on the 7th, takes, takes, bishop takes e6, check, King up, we are close to draw territory because after this move, rook to a7, there's this super strong reply, king to f6. So this worked because the pawn moved up to f5, there's king to f6 in this very specific force line. Now, in the game, we had bishop to d6. And after bishop to d6, rook to b7, now if rook to e7 is played, going for that exact same line, there's takes takes, check, king up, rook a7. White is completely winning because there is no king to f6, and king to f8 falls for pawn to c7, followed by c8 queen. So f5 was a critical move to create that escape square for the king on f6. Now, in the game, Kaidanov played king to h8, and there's a second brilliant move of the game from Carlson. If you want to pause the video and try to find it, go ahead. The brilliant move is bishop takes e6, double x clam. Ouch, this is painful for black. Rook takes e6 cannot happen because of rook to a8 check, leading to a back rank mate. Rook e7 played, trying to trade rooks. Rook takes, bishop takes, and Magnus calculated here that trading off that set of rooks would lead to a win for him. He's so precise in the endgames. Let's see if he can convert. Rook a8 check, king g7. Rook a7, attacking the bishop. Uh, again, king f8 falls for c7. So we've pretty much looked at a position like this. Rook takes c6 played. Rook takes e7 check. And at this point, Hidanov resigned. And I'll show you why. If king to f8 played... Oh, he actually resigned after... Sorry. He played king f8, rook f7 check. Now he resigned. And I'll show you why. If king to g8 here... There's rook takes f6 check, the king moves, check again, bishop moves. So Hans, or sorry, Magnus is up a bishop and a pawn. Don't know why I said Hans there. The other line is king to e8, bishop d7 check, take the rook, take the rook, and here Magnus is up a full bishop. So overall, this was a great event for Kaidanov. He almost pulled off a win or even a draw in this game against Magnus. Let me know in future videos which players' games would you like to see highlighted. Um, let me know in the comments section below. And thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.